Stephen, thank you for joining me on the podcast. Oh, and thanks for having us. Uh, I, I met you many years ago. You may not remember this. I met you when we were, when I was part of Zenith Investment Partners and we were doing some funds management research at the time you were at Evans and Partners. And I believe, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this on, on air, but I believe you were managing a lot of money at the time. Yeah. Um, at the point that I left Evans and Partners in late 2017, I was responsible for about $1.1 billion of client assets. Hmm. Well, I'm, uh, we'll get to that in just a moment. And uh, what I really wanted to say about that was there's some messaging, there some messaging that stuck with me around risk management and some of the concepts that you have around portfolio construction, even your security selection and valuation, which I'm sure some of our uh, more advanced listeners will, will get a lot of context from and they'll be able to draw on those examples and potentially apply them to their own investing. So once again, mate, thanks for joining me on the show. Thank you. What I like to do at the beginning of the Australian Investors podcast series is go back and understand more about you and for our listeners to understand how your investing today has been shaped over time. So why don't you go back to the beginning? Where did you grow up? Did you have any early influences towards money or investing? And, uh, and we'll jump off from there. Great. Okay. Well, um, I grew up in Sydney. I ended up spending 10 years living and working in London, but my formative years were in Sydney. Uh, I finished high school in 1987, so the stock market crash in, in 1987 was something that I remember discussing in our economics class. Um, and then I did a, a Bachelor of Business at what became UTS in Sydney, majors in finance and marketing. And I think all through my high school years, I had an interest in business. I remember lying on the living room floor on Sundays, reading the Sunday paper and reading mm. about, at that point, the business building and ultimate, ultimate collapses of the likes of the Bond Empire and Christopher Scase. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was fascinated by um, business activity and uh, what makes a good business and uh, in those cases, uh, some of the things that led to the uh, corporate collapses there. Did that come, did, did the interest come from anyone within your family or friends or the mentors early on, books even? Oh, look, I certainly became a very avid reader into my professional life and I love learning and really subscribe to the Charlie Munger notion of uh, a uh, lattice work of mental models and drawing on lots of disciplines. Uh, but there was no particular family member that was invested or active in financial markets. It was something, a kind of a path that I discovered myself. Mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned you went to uni. Did you, did you study finance at school? And is that what led on to university or was it just this interest that you had, this passion? Yeah, I, got, I, I liked the quantitative subjects. I liked mathematics. Um, I did like economics, um, but I think it's really subsequent to my formal schooling and education years. I learned to appreciate that investing is much more about the quantitative metrics and the psychology and lessons mm -hmm. you know, to the, the uh, Charlie Munger mindset of drawing from uh, sciences and engineering, physics and uh, behavioral sciences, I think are very relevant and I've enjoyed drawing on those disciplines and applying them to how, we, how I invest. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, I, I can see that in some of the, the insight pieces that you've done and even the videos on the website. Um, it, it, it's actually great to see someone who applies those quantitative models but then can back it up with the, the qualitative piece as well. So why don't you take us through that state, that first, I, I guess, that induction into investing. So you, you studied at university, then what happened? Well, my second year of university, I was fortunate to win a scholarship from Bankers Trust that allowed uh, some high-performing university students to do summer internships. Mm -hmm. So I ended up doing two internships at BT and then ultimately joined BT in the credit department upon completion of my university degree. And in that, uh, in the credit's an interesting place to start because the risks are asymmetric. The best mm -hmm. that can happen is you get your money back. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a, uh, you know, that was the, the mindset of you know, very, a very risk-conscious uh, approach to assessing the counterparties of the bank. Mm -hmm. uh, during that time in my first year, I was fortunate enough to work on a corporate advisory project that required a lot of um, well, uh, involvement with some large corporate relationships the bank had in, in the energy and utility sector. It uh, allowed me to really decompose the economics and um, financial models of these uh, counterparties, the power generator and the power producer and the power you know, customers. Mm -hmm. And then subsequent to that, at the end of that first year at BT, joined the Australian Equity Research Team. And that was really when I got into the to buy side investing. Mm -hmm. And were you personally investing before this? Uh, I wasn't. My, look, my first year was I bought 1,000 shares at $3.30, uh, the Orbital Engine Company. 
mm-hmm. uh, which I ultimately sell, sold at a loss. I think that's probably a good thing rather than a bad <laughs> thing uh, to, to learn that you know, making money and investing is hard. Uh, so having gone and visited what was a pretty exciting Australian technology company in Perth you know, during that first year, I came back and bought some shares and, and ultimately that business struggled and you know, there's a lot to learn from you know, corporate failures. Mm. I think it, that's the, the outcome of your first investment is often binary. It's, it's often very good and, and you just become, I, I guess, uh, you just become over-enthusiastic and, and your humility goes out the window. Uh, but having that first loss is almost just a reality check and, and, and if you're uh, passionate enough to come back, it shows something is in you, I, I think. Yeah, I, I think these, the finance industry, there's a pretty high attrition rate through time. Um, but if you do stay at it and if you've got a high appetite to learn from your experiences along the way, um, and I think the key mindset there is to recognise that um, when things go wrong, not to explain it away and not to, oh, it's all bad luck and mm. um, it was um, uh, everything would have gone right other than this. And so to recognise your own um, fallibilities mm-hmm. and then to create feedback loops and to be an active learner and try and improve through time. So, you know, always reference back, you know, what you missed, what you could have learned, what you could have got done better, uh, and next year you'll be a little bit better. Mm, wonderful advice. Uh, why don't you take us through the next steps in, in your career? Because looking, if I just look at your career and your CV, it, it's top notch. It just looks incredible, like the experiences that you've had. And I think you, I've heard you mention before that some of the experiences that you had have just been special. So why don't you take us through those, those next roles in the industry and, and how you got to London and then your time there and why you came back? Yeah, look, um, yeah, there was a, f- a few steps along that path. Uh, after a few years at Bankers Trust, you know, shortly after you know, Platinum Asset Management was established by some uh, former um, BT investors and, and I joined that group at the uh, beginning of 1994 um, and there was uh, some fantastic learning years. I was working alongside some very talented investors. Uh, it really felt to me mm-hmm. that uh, I was playing Champions League football, if you like, to draw on a sporting analogy and you know, mm-hmm. participating with some some great minds. Uh, so that was a great experience. I was had primary responsibility for the US equity market uh, within a, what was at that time a very small team. Um, and w- then after three or four years with the Platinum Group, joined Colonial First State, who was greenfielding a global equity team in Sydney, mm-hmm. uh, which was ultimately moved to London. And All right, so know, the actual role moved to London. Yeah, Colonial First State had a life company in London at the time and the global equity team in Sydney or you know, some of the members of that team were moved over and I guess integrated into the uh, other asset management team that Colonial had in London mm-hmm. and you know, that there was uh, a few good years there and, and ultimately I moved on to join a team that Goldman Sachs Asset Management was creating from scratch to serve the high net worth clients of Goldman Sachs International and uh, again worked for a very talented investor an Australian who was with Goldman Sachs firstly in New York and then London called Matt McLennan and what became a, a team of five or six people and managing um, about $6 billion Australian of uh, uh, client assets in a concentrated high quality global equity portfolio. So is that where you um, you learnt to invest in this very highly concentrated, high conviction uh, with this, I should say, philosophy and, and process? Oh, it was certainly a an experience from which I drew um, a, a lot of lessons that have impacted how I invest today. Um, but I think through subsequent experiences, I've continued to evolve such that um, the process we employed at AOS is quite different from uh, what I em- was part of at Goldman Sachs. Um, the key difference, I guess, is that at Goldman, we own a quarter 30 stocks. At AOS, we own about half that. Uh, mm. at at Goldman, we we're happy to own stocks from every sector of the market and we're a lot more selective at AOS and, and we can get into that as we go through this discussion. Mm, for sure. So this time uh, in your life, you were in London and correct me if I'm wrong, this would have been about the time of the GFC? Yeah, would you believe I was, uh, in addition to covering a few other sectors, I was within our small team responsible for banks and insurance companies uh, and that left some pretty deep imprints. Um, the you know, One of the most probably... Um, uh, searing lessons was during the 2008-2009 uh, period, the Bank of England had an emergency overnight facility that they made available to banks that fell under they, their jurisdiction. And every morning the Bank of England would issue a press release to notify the market whether any bank had drawn on their emergency lending facility that previous day. Uh, but they wouldn't identify the bank that drew on it if in fact it was drawn upon. Mm-hmm. So every morning there was a, a, a 
process or a game in the market where every sell side and every buy side banks analyst would call every bank and say, was it you? Mm. Um, if the facility was drawn upon. And the key lesson from that is that at the time that you, you most need to know that if a bank is under duress, they can't fund themselves from conventional channels and they have to go to the lender of last resort, they can't tell you that. Mm. Because if they put up their hand and said, well, it was, it was me, then the conventional channels will shut mm. and, and the bank will shut. Uh, so those banks depend upon the kindness of strangers. And we, we want to own businesses that don't depend on the kindness of strangers and they don't have to lie to you when things go wrong, uh, whereas banks can only lie to you um, when things are most stressed. Mm, that's a very interesting insight. I don't think I've ever heard of that, 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 uh, that process before. And so did you ever call a, a bank and would they ever say, yes, it was me? Well, I knew what they were going to tell me, <laughs> so, uh, that it was a pointless exercise, but nevertheless, you know, lots of people were making those same phone calls. And the other key message or key experience I remember is when Northern Rock, which was a, a mortgage lender in the UK, uh, on Saturday morning, I remember watching the television while queues were forming outside the branches of Northern Rock as there was a, literally a run on the bank that ultimately made the bank um, fail. There ultimately wasn't a problem with the asset side of that bank people didn't default in their mortgages um, the problem was on the liability side mm. and that was a wholesale funded uh, mortgage lender and they couldn't fund themselves for a period through the, the wholesale channels and again we don't want banks that depend upon the kindness of strangers mm -hmm. that the bank didn't uh, lose money on the asset side their problem was their inability to fund themselves on the liability side um, so a lot of a lot of key learnings and mm. as a result of that yeah that's uh, in um, it created a deep imprint on my mind and informs as much as what we don't do, which is invest in banks, uh, as what we do do and you know, like to own business with, with conservative capital structures mm. uh, that don't fall into financial stress during periods of you know, e economic troubles. I, it might be a mistake for me to ask this then if you don't invest in banks now, but do you see any of these, or any similarities between that time and today? I mean, a lot of people are talking about narrowing margins at, at banks and, and, and risks in the financial system. Do you see that today? Oh, look, I think there's certainly a lot of risks, but the, you know, banks are ultimately very opaque businesses. Mm -hmm. And uh, as an outsider, you might say, well, okay, I recognise that in aggregate it's, it's not a great industry, um, but why don't I go and pick just the best bank? And I think that's a challenging task. We might say, well, five or six years ago, a lot of people would have ident identified Wells Fargo as the best retail bank in America. And in the last three or four years, we've discovered that you know, there's a lot of bad practices going on in that bank, which is having lasting mm. uh, regulatory and reputational impacts on that bank. You might say, okay, well, I, I think the Northern Europeans are pretty trustworthy people. <laughs> um, why don't we invest in a Northern European bank, uh, only to find that uh, Danske Bank was, was channeling tens of billions of dollars of uh, Russian money in a money laundering exercise through their Estonian branch. Uh, so, and then there's countless other examples um, and there are also businesses that don't seem to learn from their past <laughs> errors. And as we read the press and, and you see the regulatory penalties that are still going on for banks in the UK and banks in the US through um, all sorts of and bad behaviour 10 years on from the financial crisis, uh, then again that informs the t you know, they're the type of business that we just don't want to own. Mm. They're, they're opaque. We're never going to work out the, the well-behaved bank from the others uh, in, in aggregate. I think the incentives as well tend to push them into uh, the, the um, questionable behaviour area. They're inherently transactional. They're always going to encourage activity which may or may not be in, in the interest of clients. Mm. Um, so I think there's, you know, for us, there's just lots of um, uh, ways in which that um, they're, they're not great economic businesses. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of leverage behind that. We don't like leverage businesses. And you know, we're, we're blessed with a huge opportunity set outside of Australia and you know, given the choices that we've got, you know, we choose not to invest in banks. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, okay, so let's before we get into more of the process and, and strategy of Aorus and, and, and how you go about your business today, can you share uh, your experiences post-GFC? So you've come back to Australia, uh, you've taken a role here. Can you explain that period? Uh, yeah, on coming back to Australia, I worked for a business called Global Value Investors, which was a uh, international equity boutique under the uh, treasury group umbrella mm -hmm. um, for a period of time. Um, uh, but there was an op well, I um, had got to know the people at Evans and Partners through the time that I was at Goldman Sachs and Goldman Sachs had a relationship with 
uh, the JB Weir business in Australia, uh, some p people from which uh, formed Evans and Partners. And so through those discussions, I ended up joining Evans and Partners and creating an international equity business from scratch, uh, which was a rare opportunity to be given a blank mm. sheet of canvas and to uh, um, imprint your own philosophy and your own beliefs and your own portfolio and build a business around that, uh, cr create a relationship with clients and, and sell your story, if you like, as opposed to inheriting a an existing portfolio with an existing process and an existing client base. Um, so that was a, a terrific opportunity and uh, you know, helped to I guess, sh shape and refine how I like to invest and the you know, mental processes and you know, the type of team or, or business that I like to build around that process. Mm. Uh, because we're going, because the, uh, from the outside, from what I can see, the way you invest at Aorus is very similar to the way you invested at Evans & Partners. But... I suppose reflecting on that time now, are you proud of what you achieved in terms of the client outcomes and how big you grew that, how large you grew that business? Yeah, I think I think the portfolio was delivered very good and very consistent client outcomes. Uh, point to point, it was in the top decile mm -hmm. of a broad peer group of international equity managers. Um, it also proved to be quite resilient during the periods of economic stress during sort of 2011 and 2012. Um, and other mm. points along the way. Uh, I think the, the, the portfolio was very consistent with the approach. We like to be able to say, and if you listen and understand to what we do, uh, we, then you can draw a pretty straight line in, in terms of how we invest and we're very transparent. We show every stock we own and all through that time, mm. the process and the portfolio was entirely consistent with how we articulate it, which I think is important. Now, all the time... Um, uh, I've got a high appetite to get better. I think it's important as an investor to recognise that you've never mastered anything mm -hmm. and there's always lots of opportunities to get better. So through that six years at Evans and Partners um, and through the journey day or I'm always keen to, to learn from the decisions that I've made, observing decisions that other people have made and always trying to get a little bit better. Mm, for sure. Mm -hmm. So now we get to the, I suppose, the, the meat and the sandwich, the, the really good stuff. So your process and there are a few things that I, through a few threads that I want to pull on here, but why don't you give us the thirty-second elevator pitch of what is Aorus and why you started it? Uh, sure. Yeah. Look, there's two probably two streams there. Look, uh, we're, we're business owners. We like to own. We want to own businesses that become progressively more valuable over time, where the risk of disappointment is low. Mm -hmm. um, and if we can uh, own businesses that become more valuable over time, at or below what they're worth today. Uh, with a low probability of being wrong, we're going to deliver great outcomes, um, and we have so far. Mm. And in terms of why we've created this business, uh, I think the best investment management businesses that I've observed around the world are independent businesses. I don't think they work well inside a financial services conglomerate, uh, banks, um, which are often inherently transactional by nature. Mm. Uh, they're often run by marketing people who want to keep creating new products. And we're very clear that we think we can do um, the best job for our clients by focusing on doing one thing well. And so we have a single product and we're only going to ever have a single product. And by that nature alone, it's very unconventional. Most asset management businesses start with one and keep adding new products. And so we're committed to doing one thing well. Mm -hmm. And we're also thinking being independent uh, is very important, allows us to be in control of our destiny uh, and to not be subject to the, the commercial whims of a, a business that and wants to create new products and you know, create activity and transactions. Mm. Great. I, I I can only imagine what it's like to set up a, an investment um, firm from the get-go and then do it again six years later. Um, I, I imagine there would be some, many similarities but some differences. What did you do different this time? Yeah, well, 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 yeah, I mean, you ask a very interesting question because along my journey, I'd say that my circle of competence has progressively got smaller and that might sound, well, that's a bit of an odd thing to say because investors are always getting smarter. They know more businesses and more sectors and more countries and the circle of competence is always getting bigger. Well, mine's gone the other direction and it's really through the lessons learned along the way of type of businesses that we think don't fit an arts process. Going back to the GSC banks, well, at that point in time, I invested in banks, wouldn't do so now. Um, I, would you believe I was the IT analyst um, at Colonial First Aid during the tech boom. And uh -huh. so learned lots from seeing the, you know, the massive influx of capital, pe people painting big rainbows and imagining big dreams, and you know, which we've seen a bit of a repeat in recent years with uh, the unicorns and all the excitement about what could be. Um, that was a pretty exciting time, but also saw just a huge amount of corporate failure, uh, all the rubble uh, mm. post tech boom. So lots of lessons learned there. 
And in more recent years, in the last you know, three or four years, there's types of businesses that I did own or would be comfortable owning a few years ago uh, that we wouldn't do so now. Uh, to give you a few good examples, at Evans Apartments, I owned some businesses in the you know, consumer staples area, Danone in the yogurt, mm-hmm. Colgate and toothpaste, Diageo in spirits, uh, Kellogg's in breakfast cereal. I wouldn't own those businesses again. And if you walk down the supermarket aisle, you can immediately see like, there's just a lot of choices. It's very competitive. The people that those businesses sell through, the retailers, are under a lot of structural pressure. And that mm. pressure is then being forced back up the chain to their suppliers. Um, they want to pay less for breakfast cereal and toothpaste. Uh, they want to draw more foot traffic into the store through changing brands. Consumers are more educated. Um, if the barriers to entry in those businesses are lower, it's easier to create a new brand, get distribution, outsource the manufacturing. The retailers want more of their own brand. So the um, the amount allocated, the shelf space allocated to brands is getting a little smaller. So those are, those are types of businesses that we'd call big moats getting smaller. Mm-hmm. And we don't want to be uh, invested in a shrinking moat. We like to find businesses who've got a, a large and widening moat. Uh, so that's one example of businesses where um, in my circle of competence has got a little bit smaller, more, more well-defined, you know, trimming the sales, if you like, mm-hmm. and we wouldn't own those businesses again. It's interesting that you say uh, that you brought up the moat and, and also I think a unique insight you have here is the, the change in direction. So we always talk about we want to own wide moat businesses or businesses that are competitively advantaged. But I think it was uh, in one of your recent updates where you've said that it's the change of direction in that competitive advantage that is so important. That's right, the direction of travel. And you can, if we can sort of measure and, and um, identify that in a, in a few different ways, market share changes are good. And we like businesses that operate in relatively stable markets where the market share is growing mm-hmm. and where you get very concerned where you see the market share going the other direction. Businesses that have got pricing power and sometimes the, the shrinkage of moat is reflected in you know, the ability, inability to put prices up. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, where we're seeing a new entrant competition is another another example. Um, another area that I did invest in at Evans and Partners I'd be more wary of today is advertising agencies. Um, again, you know, five or ten years ago, you'd say these are formidable businesses, employ lots of creative people, a scale really matters in the volume of media buying. Mm-hmm. Um, but what you're seeing you know, progressively in recent years is some of their big clients do more of this stuff themselves. You know, the Nikes are, are very, and Apples are very sophisticated, do some of that stuff themselves. Um, you know, the ability of small groups of creative people to enter that in- industry um, and chip away at the market shares of the dominant players. Um, and also the likes of Accenture, uh, who we do own in the portfolio, have mm-hmm. created a formidable position in digital advertising and communication. So you can see that the, you know, the, the relevance of the groups like Omnicom and WPP and Interpublic, you know, the mad men of, of their age, mm. has now got a little smaller. And so they're big but shrinking moats mm. um, that we're you know, very wary of. Mm. You, you actually wrote this, tre- this tremendous piece, and it was actually part of a series that you did, but um, this piece about finding companies and you did a bit of a cross-section of companies that earned high returns on investor capital but also they were more persistent. We found in time that they've become more persistent. And so I'd like to step into your process a bit with a bit more granularity now because investors or listeners sitting back thinking about the way you invest probably think you've got the whole world to invest from. How do you narrow it down to these really good businesses? We get that you avoid some industries, uh, but perhaps you can take us through that first step. How do you just filter out companies? What's the simplest tools that you use to, to get to a manageable list, I guess? Yeah, look, the first thing is liquidity. Uh, we value the ability to get in and out of uh, positions. And so from a huge tens of thousands of listed companies internationally, um, the number of, of those that trade in sufficient daily liquidity or have a market cap that's big enough for us to comfortably invest in would be about 4,000. Mm, uh, okay. And then we say, well, not, a, not only do we not invest in banks, we don't invest in commodity business. Well, why is that? Well, we think our ability to make judgments on what's the normal price of oil, what's the normal price of iron ore, um, what's the supply curve look like for coal? Um, it, what's the um, a governments in the Western world becoming you know, pro-coal or anti-coal? All of those um, judgments, we think we're just not going to make make good judgments about that, so we won't invest there at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it takes out another chunk of the market. We're also very wary of government regulation. Now, government regulation, we imagine as, as goalposts, and the government seems to move those goalposts around if, as it pertains to... Um, uh, healthcare policy, reimbursement rates, approval of new drugs, um, telecommunication spectrum, who you can build a network, uh, 
uh, with uh, so those goalposts move seem to move around with ever increasing frequency. Mm. Not only do governments change with disturbing regularity, but you know the prime ministers change pretty mm. often too, and they bring their own policies. Uh, so, well, where does government regulation matter? Utilities, telecommunication companies, a lot of healthcare depends on regulation. So, as as we pair away those types of businesses that we think um, are, are not going to we're not going to make repeatable good judgments about, um, then it gets us down to a different set of businesses. And the, the type of businesses that we really gravitate towards are businesses that provide essential products and services to other businesses, Accenture's being a good example, and, and we can talk about a few others. And we find that while it's pretty easy for a, a consumer to change their brand of shampoo or change their mobile phone from time to time, uh, when businesses have got suppliers providing essential services, it's a much more durable relationship. Mm -hmm. um, it's um, the barriers to entry are higher, and those are the types of companies that you'll find populate our portfolio. Mm. I, I, I have heard you say before that you, you prefer companies, not you necessarily that you won't invest in business to consumer, but business to business, and when there's technical professionals in there as well. So perhaps you can describe in a bit more detail why you, you like those businesses, how that selling process benefits the company. And I think a really good example here that you've, you've given before is the FANG stocks because they're business to consumer. Like we all know the big tech companies. So a lot to unpack in that question. But yeah. why, I guess what, where we can start is why you like the, the, the business to business or the technical professionals. Yeah, and if I'm a business selling to another business, well, um, that's a great start. If I'm selling to the procurement department, the conversation is going to revolve around price. <laughs> now, a better place to be is if I'm selling to a user of my product, um, and particularly if it's a technical user, imagine I'm selling to an engineer, imagine I'm selling to a chemist, uh, imagine I'm selling to somebody on the factory floor, imagine I'm selling to the CIO. Um, and for those people, the conversation is going to be around much more about what value can I bring, how can I help them solve their problems, how can I help make their processes more efficient, mm -hmm. how can I re improve the quality, reduce the defect rate, and price is going to be a much smaller part of the conversation. And well, well, let's talk about Nordson. So Nordson was founded by Mr. Nord uh, and his sons in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, four or five decades ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and they dominate the world market in a, a product or process called hot melt adhesive dispensing. So we can imagine glue in a liquid form. And where might you find that? Well, inside your mobile phone, there's lots of components and uh, the, the mobile phone company is trying to pack a lot of components into your phone so very efficiently gluing them together is important uh, we don't want them to uh, to slip and move around you might want the phone to be waterproof so mm -hmm. the glue is very important and so what you'll find Nordson doing is supplying equipment that can create uh, micro dots about 600 per square inch uh, as thin as a dollar bill uh, in a very precise highly mm -hmm. engineered process um, on a mobile phone manufacturing plant. Now, you might also find them at Procter & Gamble. We're making nappies. Now, the mm. glue in this case is going to be sprayed into the nappy. Now, it's very important that works <laughs> well. Any parent would know that if there's not enough um, glue to bond the product together, that's bad news. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the process, there's going to be a, a cardboard box. It's got to get folded and bonded together. So, again, we're going to uh, inject some glue into the process to uh, bond those cardboard boxes together. Now, some of the part of the magic of that business is Nordson doesn't sell to a distributor. They don't sell to the procurement department. They'll have their own engineers on the factory floor with the Apple manufacturer, with Procter & Gamble, um, mm. with other maybe an automaker which is using the glue in bonding uh, tail lights onto a car. And that ability to sit with their user is a very valuable place. It means you're hearing directly from the user um, problems that they're having. Uh, problems that they're trying to solve, uh, products that they're trying to create where you can play a role, and that creates a feedback loop. I'm going to feed, I'm going to tell my R&D department what things we need to work on. I'm going to tell them uh, what problem problems that they're having, and it's a very difficult position for a new entrant to un unseat. Mm. Um, the you know, the engineer doesn't want to have five people calling on a day with alternative products. You know, you're the trusted guy who who sits with him or visits him and uh, helps to create solutions to uh, improve improve his life, improve his products and processes. Mm. Uh, and look, another example is Accenture. Now, if we go back a couple of decades, what that what that business was all about, well, let's put a big ERP implementation into a big corporate customer, imagine Unilever or, or Nike, and at the same time, we're going to rip a whole lot of costs out and send the people to India or, or offshore to uh, a less developed country. Now, if 
Accenture hadn't evolved what it does and was doing today what it did 15 or 20 years ago, it would be a lot less relevant to its clients. Um, but what's differentiated Accenture from some of its bigger peers like an IBM or a, some of its Indian outsourcing companies is it's continued to evolve and become increasingly relevant to its clients such that um, when it's, it's not in, uh, selling services to the procurement department and we're the cheapest guy to do your job, um, they're pitching to the board of directors, to the CIO, to the CEO. It's a very IP rich company now um, mm. and it, it's relevant in many more places in a large organisation than it was 10 or 15 years ago. And we can, we can validate that by saying, look, how, how long do they keep their customers for? Well, 97 of the top 100 customers have been customers for more than 10 years. Mm. Uh, and they, they sign $100 million and plus uh, contracts with you know, many, many uh, companies and they're deep, enduring relationships uh, that, are, that are very hard to unseat. You know, they're profitable and they've also you know, grown at a very attractive rate. They've grown at about twice the rate of GDP or twice the rate of the end market over a long period of time. Uh, that's another validation that they're continuing to do more things with their existing customers and, and win more customers. And that's that another example of that direct technical relationship. They're not being intermediated in the way that you know, Danone sells yogurt to Woolworths. Um, Accenture uh, provides services to you know, the very highest level of their organisational customers. It's it's a I think that's a fascinating in- insight because oftentimes, at least in recent times, maybe there's a bit of recency bias, but we think about companies as um, they supply mission critical services, and we think naturally many of us, maybe it's just myself, but we think software because it's so sticky. But you've managed to find a collection of businesses that actually have those sticky relationships that aren't necessarily in this quote unquote high tech space, and I think that's that's. A tremendous um, achievement because they're not exactly easy to filter for. You can't almost quantify that relationship, right? So how do you go about finding these companies? Well, if we also filter by um, profitability, you now we can use a database, a Bloomberg or a Factset, mm-hmm. and say, look, just uh, from the in- industries that we're interested in, show me the companies that have earned a profit margin or return on capital above a certain level over a long period of time, and that's going to be quite helpful. Um, but it's also wide reading and and reading with you know, the right mental filters to identify the businesses that sound um, like um, the businesses that um, you know, we're attracted to. Like a good example is Compass Group, the world's largest contract catering company. Uh, mm-hmm. They feed 20 million people a day through 40,000 restaurants, including Wimbledon, so sporting mm-hmm. arenas like Wimbledon, um, National Gallery Victoria and... Uh, Google corporate campuses, they feed every Google employee in the world, hospitals, universities, remote mining sites, defence facilities. Now, they have a customer retention ratio of 95%, which means they keep their customers on average for 20 years. Mm. Uh, in fact, in the United States, the retention rate's 97 97.5%. Mm. Uh, so that's quite special. And what's helped them do that is a very clear focus on what they're good at. Uh, they don't try and add on services into a contract that might be peripheral to the core service of catering and feeding your employees and so clear focus on what you do well and we try and reflect the same mentality in our business um, mm. and uh, a, a really a clear focus on what they're there to do for their clients and when we've got wage inflation and, and food inflation they see it as their responsibility to create productivity and efficiencies as much as possible and only uh, go to their customers to ask for price increases as a last resort and so customers can depend upon them to be efficient suppliers. If we're going to outsource this, uh, we want to know that we're not going to get, not going to bite us back mm. um, by egregiously increasing prices. Um, so a real focus on what they do well, a real focus on delivering great client outcomes, um, has produced you know, the sort of economic metrics that show up when we're filtering uh, for good businesses. Mm. Uh, I, I would like to segue a bit more um, away from the filtering per se now with you and and talk about the three uh, types of um, factors that you consider when you're uh, going through a business once it's on your list already and I'll we'll, maybe we can tackle them in order but I'll just quickly overview is it's a business franchise we've got management and we've got the capital structure effectively so perhaps we've talked a bit about the business franchise but perhaps you can just give us the broad overview of what that is you've alluded to some of the 
things you look for. Yeah, look, you've, you've used a great expression which we which we like to use a lot, the value to cost ratio. We, we want customers of this particular business to feel like they're getting a great outcome um, mm-hmm. because then they're less likely to be looking for alternatives. Okay, a, a, good, a good example we can talk a little bit about is a business based in Minneapolis called Graco um, and they specialise in highly engineered equipment that's used to mix, meter and dispense fluids. It's, mm. a, it's a long way of saying, imagine spray painting. Okay, well, it gets a bit more complex if we're blending two different types of paint in a particular application and we've got to do it in very precise ratios and that's what they're very good at. And let's imagine that we're spraying anti, anti-slip surface covering on a road. Okay, well, you know, the, the pumping and the dispensing has got to be a bit more special so that it doesn't clog up. Mm-hmm. Um, let's imagine we're spray painting a ship or a building or we're injecting um, insulation material into a, a roofing cavity. Um, they dominate those markets globally and um, they make their, their products get a little bit better every year. They might use a little bit less energy. They might create a little, create a little bit less wastage. They might require a little bit less labour. And so they're able to demonstrate not only do we represent a high value to cost ratio, but every year um, that value proposition gets a little bit better. Now, spray painting is a great alternative for a brush and roller, and so they can um, go to professional paint sprays. Well, if you use this equipment, you're going to save a lot of labour hours, Mm -hmm. Um, and as labour becomes more expensive, that's a stronger proposition. Another good example is uh, um, I've been to their factory in Minneapolis a good number of times, and the CEO walks me through the factory because he comes from the operating side of the business like a great cultural example is he knows everybody by name mm. and so we walk around and he gets to a, a new product development guy we have a chat about well, you know, what have you been developing and a few years ago he said well um, here's something special we've come up with we've been able to create a product that electrostatically charges the paint as we spray it it's like well that's pretty interesting um, what do you use that for well imagine we're spray painting railway rolling stock and there's a lot of drift, a lot of this stuff gets, gets blown away in the air. Um, we waste a lot of paint. Um, there are environmental implications for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can't just uh, spray paint everywhere and um, there are restrictions on how much of that we can actually do before we have to stop s- spraying. The environmental reg- regulations won't allow us to do that. So now we can electrostatically charge the paint. It gets attracted to the metal. Well, mm-hmm. now we waste a whole lot less paint. Um, the facility can operate more days of the year before they run into environmental problems. Um, and it's going to save the customer money, um, save them time because we don't have to spray more hours to coat, coat, uh, coat the same surface. So that's a terrific example of a high value to cost ratio, creating innovations that really add value to the mm. customer. Um, and it's a it's demonstrably uh, an easy sell. You can pretty easy ca- easily calculate this is going to save you this much paint, um, improve your uptime by the, by this much every year, save you this much labour. That's worth a lot. Mm. And, and you touched on management there. Uh, I've heard you say before that just looking at the annual report or going through a proxy statement or, or the like can be a bit of a blunt instrument. So how do you think about management? Because I imagine if you've got a portfolio of 10 companies, you hang on to every word that they, that they give you. Um, we want to have annual reports that are written by management. Now, sometimes you can say, well, actually, I think a PR person wrote this hmm. or I think a lawyer wrote this one. Um, and I think it's pretty obvious when people are authentically writing themselves. That's number one. Um, they want to communicate directly to the people that own the business. Um, they want it to be from their mouth, not um, not by a scribe, if you like. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's also important to have that messaging consistent through time. So if we go back through multiple years of annual reports, do we feel like it's the same person with the same mindset and same beliefs or is it a bit all over the shop? Um, how do they talk when they have a bad year? Not every year, not every year is great. Um, mm. if, and uh, years and year, years ago, I remember in the mid '90s when Disney was run by Michael Eisner. There was a partic- particularly bad year, and I read the chairman's letter in the annual report, and I felt like, hang on, this there's no, this is no reflection of what actually happened in your business that year. I mm. think this is from the this is from the fiction p- department of Disney. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to go into the PL and work out actually that was a, you had a not a good year. But if I read your letter. Um, that's not what you're telling me. Mm. So a sense of authenticity, a sense of candor, um, a sense of consistency. And if I'm hearing from different people in the business, do I feel like I'm hearing from people in the same business or are they using different language and are they talking about as if different things are important to them, mm. a consistency of culture. 
Now, I'll give you um, uh, the, the Graco is a good example where the CEO, he obviously loves the manufacturing environment. Um, he connects with it. He, he likes the people. Um, the people there stay a very long time. Um, they like him. Um, we met with uh, a business that we own in the portfolio called Sintas, based in Cincinnati, some weeks back. And the first thing that when we met the CFO, he sat down, the first thing he did was to hand us a book called The Spirit of Sintas. And that's a book that they give to all their employees. And it, um, when I read it on the plane that evening, then uh, it's maybe it's 50 pages, but it talks about the corporate history, the personal history of the people that founded the business, you know, their family experience through the Great Depression and how that has had a lasting imprint on you know, how the business thinks and operates and the culture of the company. Now, the very fact that he gave it to us told you that it's important to him. And now we want to see, well, is the comp- does the company operate in a way that's consistent with that? You know, we don't mm. want a, corp- a corporate set of values that's just a, a sign on the wall that no one pays attention to. Do they live their values? And so can we draw a straight line between what they say and what they do? Um, so that's all part of you know, forming a, uh, a composite model. I think I've heard you say before, and you summed it up really well, where you said that excessive leverage um, erodes the durability of a business. And I think that's a really good way to think about the durability. And I imagine you would stress test this, you would look back in time to periods when, like you say, it wasn't as predicted and, uh, and see how the business fared in those environments too. So we'll, we'll look back at um, the GFC, a period of particular economic stress, and we'll say we only want businesses that, that are not only profitable but highly profitable in the worst of times. Mm. Um, because going forward, well, there's lots of bad things that can happen in the world. We're not going to know when they're going to take place. So rather than take the approach as some people would, say, well, let's try and predict when bad things will happen and then adjust our portfolio accordingly, we take the view that well, we can't predict what we can do is prepare, and we prepare by not owning businesses at all. Um, they're going to be in trouble during periods of recessions and periods of economic stress. Mm. So if we go back to 2009 and we exclude businesses that earned a return on invested capital less than, uh, let's call it an 8% cost of capital, then that's going to stand us in good, in good stead as we go forward and were we to encounter, encounter you know, recessions and future uh, difficult economic environments. Mm. That's interesting, um, and and I think it's a really important thing to do, particularly if you're investing in a concentrated way for businesses that are in n- not not so much mature markets, but in stable markets, as you say. Uh, one thing that stuck with me from the time that I, I met you before was the way you value a business. Ha- has that changed over time? Has it changed in recent times? Maybe you can shed some light on the way you go about valuing these businesses. Yeah, um, so there's a few key facets of our of our approach um, look the first thing is that we calculate an absolute value and that means that it doesn't move up and down the, um, the what we think Accenture's worth or a Sintas is worth or Graco's worth mm. doesn't move up and down as interest rates move up and down it doesn't move okay. up and down as as equity market aggregates move up and down just because interest rates are abnormally low at the moment and even if they were to continue to stay abnormally low it doesn't in our view make a business worth anymore um, now that's quite mm. different from views that other people will take. We, d- we don't do DCFs or, mm. or discounted um, dividends from the future because we know that um, humans are biased optimistically. We can talk a little bit more about behavioural biases, but one thing we all know is that um, we're, we're optimistically biased. It generally makes life a better experience. Mm-hmm. Um, but we recognise that we're human too. And if we um, calculate the uh, cash flows for a business into perpetuity, then we're more likely to be um, too high than too low. So instead of doing that, we we apply multiple to uh, trailing or last 12 months cash flow. Mm. So it's conceptually consistent with discounting future cash flows, um, but it tries to minimise the optimism bias that gets hardwired into the process if you're valuing future cash flows. I have had it, heard it said that a DCF model is a bit like the Hubble telescope. If you move it an inch, you're in a different galaxy. <laughs> so it's, it's hypersensitive to the inputs, like the discount rate. Mm. Now, so we've got our cash earnings. We're going to value trailing cash earnings. So the question then is, well, what multiple do we put on? And there, there's two key variables. The first is how fast do you think the business is going, is going to grow? And the second is, is the risk premium. Now, I think philosophically, and this is an important area where I think we're quite different from most, is a lot of investors spend a lot of put a lot of emphasis on the G. Mm. If someone's if someone uses the expression a peg ratio or a price to growth ratio or a um, 
then it tells you that they think um, the only variable that matters is growth. Well, we think um, what matters most is risk uh, or the quality of the, the business and the balance sheet. So we're going to focus a lot on the risk premium. Mm. And we might say that uh, let's take Accenture. Uh, for a, We think it's a much lower risk th- business than, than an average business. Mm-hmm. It's a lower risk capital structure than, than most. In fact, it has not a dollar of debt on the balance sheet. And we'd say, well, management, let's have a think about management. Well, for um, their role as stewards of the business and stewards of capital, we think they're a better than average management team. So for those three reasons, we're going to say it's um, uh, it's a higher quality business and a lower risk business. So our risk premium is going to be lower. And if we invert that, it means that the multiple we apply is going to be higher. So we can value a business at a substantial premium to the average without even referencing growth um, because we're thinking about risk premium. And I think a lot of people don't think about risk premium at all. They think only about growth. So if we... Um, to the extent that we value our businesses at premiums, um, most of that premium comes from the quality or risk characteristics of the businesses we own and a little is going to come from the growth. We try and be very conservative on the growth. We, make, we don't assume things are uh, better prospectively than they have been historically. Uh, it's easy to, to do. Um, or if very fast-growing businesses are going to continue to grow at very fast rates because then you can run into trouble and assume that 20% growth is normal and, and value a business accordingly, you know, only to find out that you know, maturation and fade of the business kick in and, and you're left disappointed. Mm, it's, this st- stuck with me from the time that we met because it seems like you have a very deliberate approach to eliminating these behavioural biases that we, we come across. Recency bias being one, for example, the FANG stocks, people have become used to these double digits, sometimes high double digits growth growth rates. So just so I can confirm and my summarize or paraphrase what you've what you've just said to us is that you value it based on trailing owner earnings, effectively, or cash earnings, trailing trailing cash earnings, and then you apply a multiple um, of that in, into the future instead of forecasting multiple years. You've effectively said this is what we think based on the quality, um, and then it's it, conceptually, like you said, the same. You get the same result. You can't become. You have this net present value of cash flow, if you like. Do I have that right? Yeah, that's it. And um, but I think that we're going to be less subject to um, the optimism bias or the hypersensitivity of a DCF model you know, to the discount rate um, if we alternatively take the approach of putting a multiple on trailing cash earnings. Mm. Um, so that's that you've got the essence of it absolutely right. Mm. I think that's a, that's a, a very important uh, concept because for people that don't know valuation, they don't necessarily understand how sensitive it is, like you said, the Hubble telescope example. Uh, most people think of valuation as this, it's a hard science and this is the answer. And unfortunately, the, the science that we've been given is, is very hard to put in practice because one subjective input can just fire off in the, into the distance of valuation that makes no sense whatsoever. So, I mean, if, I'm sure our listeners would be keen to follow along. And if you do produce anything like this uh, on this topic, would be, I'm sure I, I would love to share it with them. Uh, anyway, I, I should move on because this is a very um, deep and, and we could we could go further into this rabbit hole and pop out who knows where. Well, uh, well I think just on, on that, Owen, I think you make a great point that um, it's, a, it's a business of, well, I think investing is a business of judgments and informed judgments drawing on experience and an understanding of how businesses operate and an understanding of behavioral biases um, it's not about um, quantitative metrics uh, i don't think you can robo invest and you can do all the, the filtering but that's the start of the process not the end of the process all the filtering is going to tell you is what has happened and our judgment is about what 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 uh, we think can continue to happen um, and also the filtering process is um, is going to spit out draw on accounting numbers which of course are imperfect mm. um, and they're also going to miss well as we touched on earlier is this a business with a durable moat that's getting wider or one that's getting smaller and again an example i thought maybe i'd touch on is in my experience living in the uk during the the gfc uh, one of the um, interesting um, permanent changes in consumer behavior was the german retailers aldi and lidl and started making an entrance into the uk market a few years before the GFC, but during the GFC, people became a lot more frugal. They lost their jobs, so worried about their income, and so they, they moved away from the Tesco's and Sainsbury's and Waitrose's to the uh, the, the new entrants who are, were more of a price sensitive 
But interestingly, as they got their jobs back, as their incomes returned, their behaviour didn't change. And there was a permanent change in the competitive structure of that market um, and, mm. so, and, and such that you know, the, the Sainsbury's and Tesco's are, um, are operating in more competitive markets now, even as the economy has returned to health. Uh, than they were were before the GFC. So that's a good example of that, you know, shrinking moat, you know, changes in consumer behaviour. Um, that, you know, looking at historical numbers, I won't give you the full picture. Mm, and again, it comes back to that valuation piece too, where you say it's very easy just to go, whatever happened before the GFC, that we can assume that that's going to happen into the future, which may not be the case. That's right. Yeah. It, part of our thinking about how did this business perform during the most stressed economic period, and, and we ask that question because prospectively we want to feel like we own businesses that all weather businesses not fair weather businesses so in addition to um, ensuring that they remained, re- remained highly profitable during 2009 uh, we also want to avoid those businesses that had a capital structure such that they had to recapitalize issue issue equity cut their dividends and perhaps even sell assets and it's interesting to note that in 2009 even though Australia was the only OECD D country that didn't have a recession, of the ASX 20 companies at the time, 11 of them cut dividends mm. and nine of them had emergency capital raisings. Mm. So uh, they're the sort of fragilities uh, that we seek to avoid. Mm. When it comes to portfolio construction, you've capped the portfolio at 15 positions and, and some listeners would think, geez, that's pretty concentrated, very high risk. Uh, I was taken back again by the way you think about internal diversification and so many people wouldn't, that sounds like gobbledygook, they don't know what internal diversification means. So perhaps you can flesh that out a bit for us and how you go about finding those things. Yeah, well, diversification is an important part of portfolio construction and I really think there's two simple ways you can go about getting it. The first is to own lots of businesses that might may do um, few things or you can own fewer businesses that do lots of things. And we choose the latter approach um, and so we like businesses that serve many different end markets in many different countries. Now, this is that's quite distinct from a corporate conglomerate where there's no common purpose. Um, but let's pick Accenture as a good example. Their customers come from every slice of the economy that you can imagine mm. in every economy in the world. And at any given point in time, some of those slices are going to be doing better than others. Some countries will be doing better than others. And Accenture's business will, in some cases, reflect those vicissitudes but putting it all together, it creates a lot of robustness, a lot of resilience to the business model that's been a very a sort of key attribute over a long period of time. And we look for that in all the businesses we own and it's such that we're not exposed to a single product, not exposed to a single customer, a single country, um, a single you know, end market. Um, so the, the, uh, the breadth, the diversification, the resilience of the business is important. And, and finding it, I think, well, again, the filters won't tell you that, it comes from you know, the, like our mental models. Uh, as we delve into an annual report or a business, that's one of the things that we're going to be attuned to. Mm. Is this what we call a one-legged stool? Mm. And oftentimes the one-legged stools are the ones that people can get most excited about. A Tesla, well, okay, there's a one-legged stool for you. It could be, it could be a very interesting story. They're creating, uh, they've got very smart people solving some very sophisticated problems. Um, but it really is, it's a single product business and there's a lot that has to go right in order for that to be a durable business. So while people can get excited about that, recognising that as humans we're optimistic, to the extent that they're wrong, they're far more likely to be wrong on the upside than the downside. And it's also a business that depends on the kindness of strangers. This is a loss-making business with a lot of debt on the balance sheet and there's no guarantees that they can continue to finance it. So it steers us back into those consistently profitable businesses Mm. that serve many end markets um, and have um, you know, been able to exist in stable markets but be the winners in those markets and, and take share over time. Yeah, it's almost like the perfect counterpoint to the way you invest. Is, I'm just thinking of that, the Tesla example. Um, one part that investors often get wrong is, is the sell discipline, what triggers a sell in a portfolio. So, so how, do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, well, I think the, it's a great question and the second of those two words I think is particularly important, the discipline in sell discipline. Now, when a stock does particularly well and it reaches you know, what we consider to be at or above its fair value, you know, oftentimes investors fall in love with the stock, um, they raise up their price target, you know, maybe they believe is momentum and they'll keep an expensive stock for momentum reasons. Um, we won't do that and so that's a pretty objective sell. Now, when it, when it gets trickier is if there's been some bad news and that can kind of happen two ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, it can happen slowly. Imagine the, uh, 
uh, the white ants underneath your, your your house and you it takes a long time to notice it but they're chipping away all the time and so that's where we're going to be hypersensitive to you know, what we touched on earlier that shrinking moat mm. gradual but shrinking moat uh, maybe a, an advertising agency in recent years has seen their moat gradually shrinking um, but quarter to quarter it's hard to notice so we've got to be particularly attuned to that now the other sort is when there's a, there's an event and there's a press release and something bad's happened there's a profit warning um, now this is where b- investors can be subject to particularly um, bad behavioral biases you go into mental fast forward you say well geez, there's bad news the stock's down i'm going to sell it and me- what's going on mentally is well the faster i sell it the, s- the sooner i can stop thinking about it it's out of my portfolio um, i don't have to look at it okay mm-hmm. Alternatively, I'm going to go into mental fast forward. I'm going to have to keep it. Management says it's all going to come right next year. Um, it's just a temporary issue, and and I'm I'm going to I'm going to buy it. And I, I certainly can't sell it at a loss. Um, we try and to really hit go slow in that process and make it objective and as thoughtful as possible. And what helps us do that is what we call our adverse event decision checklist. And it's quite a, um, <laughs> a quite a mouthy term. So where does it come from? Well, there's a guy called Atul Gawande, who today heads the healthcare joint venture between J.P. Morgan, Berkshire Hathaway, and Amazon. And a couple mm. of years ago, those three companies said, "Well, we employ a lot of people, maybe a million people, and healthcare uh, in the U.S. is one of our biggest costs. So how can we better manage those costs? And who's someone we can bring on board to help us do that?" So. This particular individual in, in about 1995 wrote an article for The New Yorker, which then got turned into a book, and the article was called um, the, uh, the Checklist Manifesto. Okay, so it, um, now he was a practicing physician, and he said, well, there's two types of hospital emergency departments, and what's common in all of them is that their environment is stress. Uh, there's a lot of noise going on. There's people in, in life-threatening situations. Um, there's a lot of noise, and in conditions of stress, sometimes good decisions get missed. Now, there's a particular type of hospital emergency room where they have a checklist on the wall. And when someone gets wheeled into the admissions area, uh, the nurse will reference a checklist and walk through a pretty s- sensible set of um, to-dos. Check the blood pressure, check the temperature. You know, being America, if it's a gunshot wound, is there an exit wound? Now, those hospital admission rooms have a lower mortality rate than those that don't have the checklist. Much less like in an aeroplane, it's important to have the checklist on the ground. It's particularly important to have the checklist when something goes wrong in the air. It's a more stressful environment. Um, so for us, if we wake up and there's a, a press release that contains bad news, then we're going to reference our checklist. Now, um, one, of the, one of the questions that we find particularly useful in countering our behavioural biases and helping us to avoid that mental fast forward is to say, well, let's imagine, let's imagine that we'll short this stock. Let's mentally invert our position now we're short the stock would we view what we just read as being confirming evidence uh, okay well um if you if you would now let's reverse back to reality on long the stock so how how differently should i think about it um, and there's other another set of questions maybe there's a dozen questions in our checklist that helps us address the issue is it material is it going to change the financial profile of the company um, how do we think about management are they trustworthy has it been a uh, a pattern of a bad events or is this a one-off how they explained it before um, is it um, within what we'd consider to be the normal boundary boundaries of outcomes this business um, or is it outside the boundaries is the explanation that they've given a reasonable one uh, if they say well we had a really bad quarter because it was raining in california um, does that make sense and so by working through that checklist it helps us to address what the particular piece of bad news objectively minimise the impact that stress might have on fast forwarding the decision and help us to make mm. better decisions. Okay, that's a great, another great one. So, Stephen, as we come to the end of the conversation, how can people find out more about you and Aorus? Well, um, if they were to visit uh, Aorus IM, Aorus Investment Management dot com dot au, um, we've tried to be very transparent mm. about how we operate as a business, how we think. As investors, uh, we put every stock we own in the portfolio on the Insights tab in our website. Uh, we have what we call an owner's manual, which I draw mm. people's attention to. Uh, we really go to um, a lot of trouble to ex- really lift the hood, explain what we, uh, how we structured as a business, what our ambitions are, so people can get a good sense of are we the right manager for them? Uh, do that? Are we a business that's likely to be a good long-term partner for them? Uh, we've got some videos on there as well. Uh, so I think more... Uh, we're unusually transparent in the, not only what we own but how we think, how we structured, what our ambitions are, and people will find lots of 
information on the website as well as a link that they can directly contact us and we're happy to answer any queries directly. Yeah, great. It's, uh, it is a good, I, I must admit, I do go to the website because you are so transparent. It's, it's, it's great to see what a proven and established investor is buying and, and why. I think it, I mean, that's a free resource for anyone. Um, okay, last question, probably my favourite, is if you go back and tell a younger you something about investing, what would it be? Oh, well, um, uh, think independently, travel. I think there's nothing like uh, travelling, which I was fortunate to do and lived overseas for 10 years. It's um, help, very helpful in broadening the mind. I think mm-hmm. in, in Australia we operate as a little island a long way away from the rest of the world. So I think travel is great for personal development, whatever profession that you choose to embark on. Um, reading widely, uh, I, I, I think it's maybe it's becoming less and less col- uh, common as kids grow up with screens and, and news feeds, but uh, there's great books, uh, still great books, uh, and there's a lot of learning to be done. You know, so learn, um, explore, uh, travel, uh, think widely, and that'll serve you well in whatever pro- profession you embark upon. Wonderful advice, Stephen. Thanks for joining me on the podcast. Thank you, Owen.